So, I'll let her get underway. No, I think they're in the room still. Yeah. Well, before you go too far, let's take care of one thing. Okay, I need you. I need you here with me. And where did my anointing oil go? Thank you, sir. Can I have all the dads? I need all the dads up front. Come here, dads. Yep. That's a father figure. That's right. So, we're going to go around and anoint all the dads. All right, gentlemen. The rest of the family, please come and lay hands on them. Jerry, come on. Let's go, Dad. He's trying to sneak out of it. Right on. All right, circle, circle the wagons here. There we go. We'll go around this way. All right. Well, Father God, we just come to you right now, and Father, we want to do the, the one thing that we need to do the most, Father God, and that's pray over these mighty men. Father God, you have anointed men. These are men of renown, Father God. You said the men are the head of the household, Father God, even though we do what our wives tell us to do. But, Father God, we are the head of our households, Lord. We are the example that you have put in place, Father God. We are who you desire us to be. And, Father God, we want to be godly examples. We want to be the, the manly examples, Father God. And it's okay for men to cry. It's okay for men to show emotion. It's okay for men to be passionate. And, Father God, we want to be those men. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be loving and caring, but, Father God, we still need to be strong and bold. And, Lord, that's what you have put men in place to do. Father God, let us lead our households as the strong warriors, as the, the heads, Lord, that you have put us in place to do. Let us raise up this next generation, Father God, in the way that you desire them to go. And you have put men in place to do this. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the glorious and magnificent men of their households, Lord. And we thank you, Father God, for the men in this family. We ask right now in Jesus' name that they would be blessed exceedingly abundantly above in all areas, in all aspects, all thoughts and all actions. Bless their hearts, their minds, their bodies, their souls, and their spirits, Father. May they be strengthened and emboldened by your word. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we all say, amen. All right. And just so all the men know, back on the back table, there's hats. So feel free to take a hat. There's three different kinds. All right, you can go now. Oh, that, oh. 
That's right. Don't be hasty about when the Lord comes, he said. All right. All right, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to show you a funny video, okay, just because I love the video. All right, you want to come up here and pray with me? No. Well, you were coming up here for something. Yeah? All right. You want to hold my hand while we do it? Okay. You want to hold my Bible while we do it? You got to hold it up there. Can you can you hold my Bible up like that? Yeah? You want to hold it up in the air like that? All right. You got to hold it up there. You hanging on to it? All right. Let's raise, let's raise God's word up for victory. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for all you've done and all you will do. We thank you for the victory that we have over the enemy over the situations, over the circumstances in our life, Father God. We pray right now that you would bless your word exceedingly abundantly above, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those who hear us, those who watch us, and, Father God, those who are amongst us. Father, we give you glory and praise right now. It's in Jesus' mighty name we all say, Amen. All right, Terry, would you show that video? I love this guy. He's hilarious. Camera recording. Turn the volume. Hey, 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 neighbor. Hey, neighbor. Hey, neighbor. <laughs> How are you? I'm going to try to be as quiet and discreet as possible. But I needed a break from the neighborhood watch. You know what I mean? Just a quick break. Not much to report tonight. Uh, out in the neighborhood, really quiet. Just one little minor incident of uh, some kids doing some uh, driveway chalk. <laughs> and I said, hey, hey, what's going on there? <laughs> Just kidding. Carry on, you little rascals. Chalk of sources. <laughs> but while I was walking around, I had to tell you a dad joke. You know what happened to me the other day, neighbor? I was about to print off one of those MapQuest directions, you know, about the car show tomorrow morning. Needed some directions. MapQuest, there you go. Print. <laughs> and uh, I heard music coming from the printer. My Atlanta, what is going on here? So I walk over there. You know what was causing the music? The paper was jamming. <laughs> I dropped my equipment. Later, Dan. See you at church. Hey, neighbor. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you want to mess with your neighbors, or if you just want to protect your kiddos, uh, the wife, the casa, or the Dodge Caravan, <laughs> call Bimmick. Use this thingy right here. <laughs> Later, Gator. I love that guy. <laughs> if you're having a bad day, look up uh, dad jokes. Dad, or uh, what is it? What is it called, Terry? Yeah, well, that one was Dad Jokes 27. But anyway, Doorbell Dad Jokes. He is hilarious. I just discovered this guy. I absolutely love him. He just makes my day. So here we are. We're talking about fathers, right? And we want to make sure that we're talking about the ultimate father. Who's the ultimate father? God. Say God. God. Right. All right. So in, in our word today, we are going to turn our Bibles to John 3.16. Anybody know that one by heart? Who knows that one by heart wants to come up here and recite it? Huh? Come on, don't be shy. I need just one volunteer. Who, who are you pointing at? It's right there. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. I was like, what are you pointing at? I was like, oh, there it is right there. You don't even have to know it by heart. All right. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Hallelujah. That is not just a statement. It's a promise that he has given to us. That if all we have to do, the simplification of it is believing in the Father's Son. How many of y'all believe in the Father's Son? Amen. Every hand in the house is going up.
So today's message title is Fathers Are Important. Are dads important? Are fathers important? Are they? Yes, they are. You better believe it. Why are dads important? What? That's who you're learning from. That's who we're getting our examples for life from. Exactly? All right, they're the head of the household, like I said in the prayer, even though we do what our wives tell us to do. Okay? Just want to make sure that we get that on record. All right? Happy wife, happy life. So, fathers, do what your, do your wives tell you to do. Be a good husband. All right? And I know that I am not a perfect dad. I've made mistakes. I, you know, my children can tell you, you know, that I didn't do everything that possibly could have done to make sure that their lives were just ultimately supreme and happy. They had discipline, right? I mean, how many of you ever been disciplined by your dad? It's a little bit more discipline, different discipline than what your mama gives you, right? You know, your mama might give you a whooping, but then she gives you a kiss afterwards. You know, dads, they just leave you in a pile of heap on the floor. <laughs> Amen? And, and I know that, you know, you, you, you look at me, you know, and as the pastor, you're like, wow, he was not a perfect dad. That's hard to believe. Well, you know, I'm just here to tell you I, I'm not perfect. Not even going to try to be. But what's reassuring is that neither are any of y'all. Hallelujah. I know that I'm not in this boat all by myself. Amen. Right. There is no perfect father except for God Almighty. Right now, and I don't say that you're not perfect to slam you in any way or to, you know, to make you feel bad or to bring disgrace upon you. It's just a fact. None of us are perfect. We all make tens of mistakes. But it's a goal for many of us to live our lives the best that we possibly can, even though there, there might not be perfection in what we're doing but we're living our lives to the best of our abilities. Some of us look to secular experts to help us uh, become better fathers. You know, we, we look to those areas where they are professionals, you know. They, they have it all together because they have a degree up on the wall. I'm sure that they make no mistakes at all. <laughs> nah. Some of us look to those so-called Christian experts to help us. You know those so-called Christian experts. You know what I'm talking about, those, those people who think they know more, that, you know, they, they season everything they do with the Word of God, but do they really live by what they're telling you? Not always. Not always. This is where, this is where discernment of spirit comes into play. And we have to make sure that be, we are being discerning in what we hear and what we take from what we're gathering. Amen? I mean, that's not just for that fact. That's for all of Christianity, right? I mean, what is the, you know, if you ever have a, and I've said this before, if you ever have a pastor come to you and say, don't, you don't worry about reading your Bible, just listen to what I say, you better get on up out of that church and run away. Right? I mean, you know, that's not the kind of church you want to be in. The kind of church we want to be in is where the pastor is kind of like me, where I say, you know what, test what I say against God's word. That's a challenge for you to hear what I'm saying and for you to go to God's word and look it up. Read it for yourself. Hear what I'm hearing from God's word. See what I'm seeing in God's word, and you'll understand what's in God's word and what I'm saying. Amen? So it's a challenge for you to do so. Now, John 3.16, it's a, it's a passage that really reveals what perfect fatherhood looks like. Because it focuses on the perfection of our Father, our Heavenly Father. If, if you're a father... This verse will give you an ideal of what it means to be a good dad. Amen? 
it teaches us four ways of heavenly fathers and how they relate to us. First of all, the first one, a father loves his children. Amen? For God so loved the world. Here's a fascinating fact. The moment your children are born, you love them. Right? In fact, we love them even in the womb. I, I used to talk to our children through my wife's, you know, belly. You know, like the umbilical cord was, you know, hello, how are you doing in there? You know, they, they probably heard it like, you know, those, McDon those old McDonald's commercials, right? Would you like a hot apple pie with that? You know, <laughs> That's the only thing I got out of that was, <laughs> no, I don't want a hot apple pie. So we wonder why our children come out of the womb going, huh? <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> this is actually what you sound like? Wow, that's different than what I heard, right? I know that most, uh, most men wouldn't admit it, but you probably do the same thing. Amen? You know, I mean, it's a, li it's a little weird, you know, for men to have to, you know, yeah, I talk to my wife's belly. Sometimes her belly talks back to me. <laughs> you know, whoa, what, you, what did you eat? <laughs> right? Or she's hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we make fun of Johnetta, but sometimes we know when she's hungry. <laughs> the point is this. They haven't done anything. Children haven't done anything to earn your love at that point, have they? But you love them anyway. I, do they necessarily have to do anything to earn your love? No. See, as a dad, we should just give it unconditionally. Right? I mean, there's, there's no written script about loving your children or saying, you know what, hey, you know, you're about to come out of your mom and I expect a field goal. You know, you better hit a home run. That's an impossibility. You know, they, they literally can't do anything <laughs> other than eat poop and sleep and keep you up all night right so why why do we love them why do we love them unconditionally it's because they're yours that that's your creation you made that you better love it amen right because ain't nobody ever going to love it like you love it and you'll continue to love them no matter what your children might disappoint you at times, and, and there might be times where you're angry with your kids, and you might want to disown them, but you'll always love them. I don't think I've ever met a father who's, who said, I don't love my children. Even mean fathers love their children, right? They just maybe were never taught the way to love, the way that we love. Amen? Here's the problem. We don't always express it, though, do we? See, man, we, we, have, this, we have this traditional click inside of us. It's like, well, I told you I loved you once. That should, be, that should cover, you know, a multitude of days, weeks, months, years, right? You, you ever ran into those, those old men that said, I told my wife I loved her once. She knows I love her. Really? And then you ask the wife, and she's like, uh, I'm kind of guessing. I don't know. Doesn't sound very confident, right? So we have to tell them constantly that we love them. It's a reassuring thing. You know, as dads, you know, our children bide for our what? Time. Right? You'll hear John Derrick say it on the radio all the time. How does a child spell love? T-I-M-E. They want time with you. They want to know that you love them. And the best way to show love to a child is to spend time with that child. Let them get to know who you are so you will know who they are. We don't necessarily always need to express love as a reward for certain types of behavior, right? I mean, for an example, 
Our child might be really acting up. In fact, we are experiencing one of those moments, you know, you might be experiencing one of those moments, we wonder whose kid is this really? No way this kid came from my genes, right? I mean, when your kid acts up in the grocery store, you kind of just want to put him in the cart and just push the cart away and walk off. You know, like, I have no idea whose kid this is. I am about to take you outside. <laughs> anyway, ever had one of those moments? We might express our love, but it goes something like this. Uh, honey, if, if you're good, I'll, I'll take you to McDonald's and, and buy you a nice salad. I ain't buying my kid no salad. So our children grow up with the idea that our love for them is conditional, right? Now, it might seem like I'm just talking about children here, but we'll get into some other facts, okay? Because God loves, for, for God so loved the world, all right, that he's talking about all of his children. Uh, it, it will also teach them that love is not just conditional. If you act up, you're going to get discipline. And Discipline is a form of love, right? I mean, our Heavenly Father, He disciplines us, doesn't He? He doesn't give us exactly what we deserve, but we don't always get what we want, right? And so there's times where it's okay to hear the words, no, <laughs> you know, I mean, I know some kids that when you say the word no, they're having a doggone meltdown. They're like a volcano, you know. They will destroy the house if you say the word no. Well, there needs to be follow-up with the word no sometimes. Sometimes it needs to be a physical discipline. Amen? And it doesn't hurt anyone. Listen, we all know that people can't read our feelings, right? Right? They can only read your actions. Amen? They can't hear what you're thinking. They can only hear what you're saying. Come on, someone. All right? That's why it's important for a father to express his love for his children in what he says and what he does. Our Heavenly Father expresses his love to us Time and time again, even in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve had sinned, God took care of them, didn't he? He made clothes for them and covered their nakedness. Right. I, he, he thought beyond the beyond the realms of their thinking. And he was like, you know what? I love my children enough to where, you know, they feel ashamed right now. What, what can I do about that? Well, I can cover their shame with clothing. So he made the, the first Gucci outfit out of, out of fur. You know, it was, it was God Gucci. And he covered their nakedness. Through scripture, throughout scripture, God affirms his love for us. We know he loves us because he says so, right? You know, the, the children's song, you know. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Time and time again, the Bible tells us. Deuteronomy 7, 7, uh, 13, 23, 5, Second uh, Chronicles 9, 8, Isaiah 43, 4, countless psalms. God tells us he loves us, and he shows his love for us time and time again. Like I said, he doesn't give us what we deserve, right? I mean, he's given to people what they deserve, right? I mean, he opened up, he, he, he divided the people one time, like the haves and the have-nots. <laughs> and he said, those who have not of me, will not receive of me. He opened up a chasm in the earth and it swallowed him up. Wouldn't want to be in the have not portion of the grocery store. Amen? His ultimate act of love was sending his son Jesus 
into the world to die for our sins. Maybe your father didn't know how to express his love for you. You know, uh, for the longest time, I didn't know if my dad loved me. Because, you know, he, he, was, he was funny and, and he did things with us. But I didn't necessarily always hear the word, I love you. It wasn't always expressed verbally and it wasn't always expressed physically. Somehow, I know that my dad loves me. I hear it a lot now. You know, I, I thank God that I have that time that I'm able to spend with my dad. You know, and, and I hear my dad, I hear the genuineness in my dad's voice when he says, I love you, son. Right? I, I didn't necessarily do anything to make my dad proud. I didn't have to do that. I, I just showed grace and forgiveness and mercy to my dad. And God took care of the rest. Hallelujah. We don't need to make a mistake of transferring your earthly father's weaknesses to your heavenly father, though. God loves you unconditionally. You know, he, he could care less what you've done. He just wants to, you to know he loves you. And, and that's a hard concept for a lot of people to get a hold of. You know, why do a lot of people not come to Christianity? Because they think that God doesn't love them. How can a God so powerful, so magnificent, so creative love me with all the mistakes that I've made? Well, it says it right here in his word. He loves you unconditionally. Right? I, I mean, I'm tore up from the floor up. And God still loves me. I know he loves me. Right? I've seen the things that he's done in my life. I know the things, and I've expressed these things to other people. You know, you could have that too. All you got to do is let go, let God. I mean, he said so. And he backs it up with his words and his actions. <laughs> Regardless of your relationship you have with your earthly father, you can have a personal heart-to-heart -heart relationship with your heavenly father. He loves unconditionally. Just because you're you, just because you're his. We are all his. He doesn't just love us because he has to. He loves us because he wants to. Amen? That's what a father does. Right? Looks past the nuances and, and the weirdness. <laughs> Trust me, some kids are weird. Anyway. You've got to look past all that, and you look at the heart of the child, and you say, you know what? I love you for who you are, as weird as you are, as nerdy as you are, right? I love you for who you are. He loves his children. Dads, don't forget to show your children how much you love them. And, and don't forget to say those words, I love you. Secondly, a father gives to his children. Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave. Right? Well, what did God give us? Well, he gave us his son. Well, you know, maybe I wanted a Ferrari. Well, <laughs> let me tell you what. I'd much rather have Jesus than the Ferrari. Amen? You know? I mean, I would rather have this eternal gift than this temporal gift. Right? I mean, these things are going to rust away. They're going to break away. They're going to go away. Where Jesus, I have the gift of Jesus. I have this eternal, everlasting gift that I could call upon any time of the day of my life. And so can you. He sent Jesus into the world to die for our sins. That's the second part of the gift, right? I mean, we, we look at some gifts and we're like, wow, this thing can only do one thing. We're looking at Jesus over here, and Jesus does a multitude of things. He forgives us of our sins. He heals us of our hurts, our habits, our hang-ups. He takes us out and in. He, he provides. He opens our eyes and our hearts to receive. There's no other gift on the world that could do such a thing. Nothing. 
can do as Jesus has done. That's God's ultimate gift to us, right? You know, you heard the gift, the gift that keeps on giving. Well, that's Jesus. Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. Jesus is the gift that does the ultimate thing, you know? He's like that favorite kitchen utensil, the all-in-one, 101 uses for whatever it is, all right? <laughs> what has God given me? I often ask this question to myself sometimes. What has God given to me? You might ask this of yourself, right? The answer is, look around at all you have. You get to a point in your life where you're like, what have you done for me lately? Well, let me tell you, as my friend Dan would say, let me tell you something about you that you don't know. Look around you. You ever get to that part in your life where you're thinking, God, what have you done for me lately? You better stop in your tracks and take a good look around. Everything you have belongs to God. We have it because he allows us to have it. Amen? I have the people in my life that are in my life. Why? Because God has placed them in my life. I have the things in my life. Why? Because God has allowed me to possess those things. They're his possessions. I'm just the manager of them. Amen? He gives us sunshine and rain. We, we look past some of the smallest things that we have. I'm thankful for the rain that we have been getting, right? Right? Uh, it's annoying that you don't get to get out and cut your grass as often as you want to, right? I mean, you know, I love the rain. I love rain. I would much rather have rain than snow, but I know we got to have it one way or the other. We live in the Dakotas. Amen? How about your talents? How about your intellect? You know, we, we can make a list of all the things that we need to remember that God has given to us. Our gifts, our talents, our intellect, our, the sun, the rain, the warm weather, the cold weather, the, the beautiful flowers, the trees. Those things that decorate our landscapes. He gives us the birds to sing to us. He gives us animals and insects to clean up after us. Thank God for raccoons. Flies, I'm not too sure about. He put a hole in the atmosphere to give all the toxins we dump into the air a place to go so we don't suffocate ourselves. How about that? God gives to us every day of our lives. He meets our needs. He answers our prayers. He tackles our problems. Man, I think we forget sometimes. Thank you, God, for taking care of that situation. Thank you, God, for removing that person out of my life, right? Because if you didn't take them out, I was going to. And I'd much rather have you move them than me, amen, because it wouldn't be a pretty scene. Thank you, God. Sometimes we're the ones that need to be taken out, right? Our God is a giving God. If your father... If you're a father, there are two things you need to give your children. Your money and your time. Right? I know dads don't like to hear that. Your money? I already give them my time. Now you want me to give them my money too? Well, you know, they need things, right? You know, they need clothes. They need a bicycle. Right? They're, they're too young to get a job. They can't do it on their own. Both are important. But the main thing out of that is your time, because that tells you that tells your child that you love them. The money just kind of comes with it. Amen. An abundance of one doesn't negate the need for the other. Come on, someone say amen. Your children need you to provide for them. Maturely, and they need you to provide for them emotionally. There's a story about a single guy who was uh, visiting his married friend. 
The married man had a little boy who was playing on the floor in front of them while they were talking. As they talked, the married man made an odd comment. He pointed to his son and said, there goes my chance for ever having a boat. As soon as I get the hospital bill paid, he'll need braces. By that time, I get to lose, I get to lose more pay and he'll want a car. When that's paid off, it'll be time to pay for college. By then, I'll be too old to want a boat. What was he saying? Being a father requires sacrifice on our part. Sometimes we don't get the things we want or desire. Why? Because we need to take care of the things around us. Amen? It's important. Not saying that those things won't come later. Right? I mean, I had to, I had to wait a long time to get some of the things in my life that I wanted. Amen? There are some things in life we have to do without because we have a greater obligation to provide for our children. As a father, there are sacrifices you'll have to make. In fact, you've probably made lots of sacrifices already as a dad. They're part of the job description and part of the joy of being a father. Your children may never fully understand how much you sacrifice for them. Personally, I think that's uh, the way it should be. They shouldn't know. They shouldn't keep track of what you've done for them. Right? The last thing your child needs to hear is, if it weren't for you, I'd have a boat. <laughs> That'd be kind of sad, right? Right? A father gives to his children. He gives time and he gives money. Both are essential, and we have to be diligent to maintain a delicate balance, a delicate balance between the two. It would be easier to just be a provider and let the wife take care of raising the children. I know a lot of households like that. But children need their father to be more than a provider. They need him to be an emotional, emotionally available too. And spending time with your father isn't an option. Here's something to keep in mind. Your heavenly father is always available. He, you can tell him any time, day or night, of your situations and your problems. You can talk to him about your troubles, your fears, your dreams, and he will listen. He is always available. A father gives. He is there for his children. Thirdly, a father has expectations for his children. How many of you know that your father has an expectation for you? Right? They might not necessarily say it. They might not necessarily be around. But your father still has an expectation. They want you to grow up to be the mighty man that God desires you to be. They want you to be successful. You know, I wanted my children to be better than me. I wanted them to grow up and to do more than I was able to do. I wanted to be able to give to them more than what I have. Amen? John 3.16 is God's plan of salvation for the children. It shows us what he does for us. He gave his son so that we can be saved. And it shows us what he expects from us. We have a role to play in our salvation. Right? What do you think the role is in your part of salvation? One word. Acceptance. If we aren't willing to accept what Jesus did for us, if we're not willing to accept what God has for us, then the part of our salvation is null and void. It's purposeless, right? God expects us to believe in him. He doesn't expect more than we can give, but he does expect us to do what we can. Now, I'll say that again. He doesn't expect more than we can give, 
but he does expect us to do what we can. We don't have the capacity to be perfect, nor do I want to be, right? You know the old saying, I don't really want a whole lot of people knowing what I know because then they expect too much of me, right? If you were perfect, can you, can you imagine the expectation that would be placed upon your life? That would be a burden that's way too heavy for any one of us to carry, right? We don't have the capacity to pay the price for our own sins. See, if I was perfect, I would think that I am the one who caused my salvation. I am the one who has done these things for myself. And we can't think that. That's a, that's a, that's a wrong mentality to have, right? And, and I know some people out there who think that they are above God, you know, in their life. I did this. I did this. I did this. That's all they talk about is, look what I did for me. I'm the one that did this. In all reality, it's like, you know what? They need to back that trailer up a little bit and dump some of the load and say, you know what? I'm emptying myself because I want God to fill me. Right? I, I want, I want the, the perfection to be placed upon the Father, not upon my shoulders. Because I can't weather the burden. Amen? But, we do have a capacity to believe. This is what God expects from us. God the Father has certain expectations for His children, certain requirements that must be met. He isn't unreasonable about it. You know, He doesn't give, I mean, He does give us a timeline, but you know what? We can always get an extension, <laughs> right? Father God, I just need a little bit more time. I need to get myself straight, you know. I need your help, <laughs> Right? He isn't unreasonable about it. He doesn't demand more than his children can give. But he does require a certain level of responsibility from his own children. John Grisham's book, The Testament, begins with a story about a man who succeeded in business beyond what most people could imagine, assuming a fortune of $11 billion. Along the way, he married three times and fathered seven children. He provided for all of them financially. But he was emotionally absent as a father. He never expected much of them. He gave each child a no-strings-attached gift of $5 million on their 21st birthday, and each child squandered the money. Wow. Eventually, each child wound up deep in debt, resentful of their father, eagerly waiting for him to die so they could collect their share of his will. Mm, sad. Though this man was a success in the eyes of the world, he was a failure as a father, and his ch children paid the price. This story is fiction, but reflects the truth. It's similar to the Old, Old Testament story of Eli. Eli was a man of God, a priest who served in the temple. Though Eli, he was faithful as a priest, he was a failure as a father. The sons of Eli had no respect for the law of God. They defiled sacrifices. They extorted from those who brought offerings to God. And they slept with the women who served in the temple. Eli knew about their behavior, but did nothing about it. As a result, God judged Eli 1 Samuel 2, a father has a responsibility to set the standard for his children, right? He must say, this is the way we live, and nothing less is acceptable. My household, this is the way we live, and nothing else is acceptable. And of course, it is the father's responsibility to lead by it example. If I'm not an example worth following, I don't expect my children to do what I'm not teaching them to do. If they're not willing to learn from what I have already been through, then how am I to teach them to be better than me? I need to lead by example. 
A father's attitude must be do as I do, not merely do as I say. <laughs> How many of you ever heard that when you was a kid, right? Do as I say, not do what I did. <laughs> but what you did looks funner than what you're asking me to do, <laughs> right? Joshua set the example for all fathers when he said, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 14, 15. A father expects his children to act like they belong to him. He doesn't demand more than they can give, and he doesn't base his love on his child's behavior, but he does expect the child to do their part. Let me read, let me read this from John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, listen, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Mm. Because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Just like our Heavenly Father expects that we do our part, we must believe in His Son. Overall, that is, the, that is the one thing that is key to the whole verse, believing in His Son. Amen? Finally, a father prepares his child for the future. Jesus said, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life, right? That rental car, that first rental car that we were going to get, did not have everlasting life. Even the gas-powered car didn't have everlasting life, right? I, I still had to stop at a station and put something in it. Amen? Amen? You know, sometimes we're kind of like that, that vehicle. Sometimes we've got to stop at the station, right? we got to stop at the station and, and get filled up, right? we got to put something in. If we don't have anything in, we ain't going to continue going. We're going to be running on empty. And I don't like running on empty. Anybody else like running on empty? It ain't a good feeling. Right? Sometimes my load is too heavy to push. I would much rather have the go power to drive it than to be behind it pushing it. Trust me. Right? I mean, that's a weight I don't want to bur burden, burden myself with. What is going on there? <laughs> God has created a great future for you and me. He is, he is offering us what? He is offering us eternal life. He doesn't want us to spend eternity without Him. He wants us to live in His presence forever, and He provided a way to make that happen. He did this by sending who? Jesus, His Son, into the world to die on a cross for our sins. When we put our faith in Jesus, our sins are forgiven, and God gives us eternal life. Come on now. Right? It's a give or take. you got to be willing to give something to take something. Right? And Jesus is like, just give it to me, and I'll give to you. you got to be willing to let it go so you can receive. If you're not willing to lay it down, then I'm not willing to forgive it. I'm not willing to push it off into the sea of forgetfulness. We got to be willing to give so we can take. Give and take. Give and take. That's what this is all about, right? If, if I want to be forgiven of my sins, I've got to lay my sins down. And I've got to be willing to take up Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you in my heart. I need you in my life. I need you in my mind because my mind is not clear. Right? And if my mind is not clear, my heart is not clear. If my heart is not clear, my life is not clear. And I want to make sure that I'm living this life with Jesus.
for Jesus so I can spend eternity with Jesus. Amen? It's about God reaching out to us through his son. God had a vision for your future. It's a future spent in heaven with him forever. And, and he provided that way for us to get there. The same way earthly fathers need to do what they can do to direct the future of their children in a way that will be most beneficial to them. I say this rather cautiously because we all know examples of fathers who go overboard in this area. You're going to be a plumber, <laughs> and that's all there is to it, right? How many of you ever had children or friends in your life, or maybe yourself, where this is how it's going to be, this is all you need to know, and your life is going to be centered on what I'm doing, not on what you want to do, right? I can't tell you countless NFL players whose fathers have said that to them. You're going to go to the NFL, and that's all there is to it. Don't think about anything else. But maybe I want to be a baseball No! You're not going to play baseball. You're going to play football. Because that's what I want you to play. What's happening here? We've all seen fathers that do this. And they, they want to realize their dreams vicariously through their children. And it's damaging, isn't it? This extreme attitude is not the kind of direction I'm talking about. Just because we have seen examples of fathers who do this, that's not what God does for us. You know, he's not pushing his thumb down on top of our head saying, You will obey! You will do what I say! Or you go to hell today! Okay, anyway. No, that's, that's not what he's doing. You know, God is saying, I love you so much that I want you to love me back. Right? He's saying, in my word, I have given you promises and precepts. I, the only thing I'm asking you to do is do what, ladies and gentlemen? I say it all the time. Love people, love God. Love God, and you'll love people. Right? It's as easy as that. That's the gospel wrapped up in a simple phrase. Love God, love people. That's the gospel. That's all we really have to do. Amen? It's as easy as that. Why do we have to complicate things? I don't know. Because we're human. Right? Because I'm really not a, the sharpest tool in the shed. <laughs> right? I'm not a hoe, but <laughs> I'm a good picker. All right. That was bad. I can see, I can see. Anytime I do that, I see my wife looking at me. She's like, give me the look. All right. Fathers should prepare their children for the future in three primary areas. One, a father should help his child prepare spiritually for the future by bringing them up in a Christian atmosphere, encouraging them to be involved in church, and challenging them to grow in their personal relationship with Christ. Amen? Two, a father should also help his child prepare for the future in his or her career. He should help his child to identify their gifts, skills, and interests and help them discover a career that's best for them. And by the way, being a wife and a mother is a career. Amen? Right? Because none of us dads want that job. Heck no. In fact, it's one of the most rewarding careers being a mom and a wife. Don't fall prey to the world's idea that a woman who chooses to stay at home to be a wife and a mother is somehow inferior. Right? Because I guarantee you, none of us dads could handle that. Right? I mean, I would have been bald a long, long time ago if I would have had to stay home with the kids. Right? I mean, I give props to my wife. You know, she's got, she's full of grace. Me, I would have had them kids lick them and stick them to the wall. Amen? I mean, I would have had to invest in gorilla tape all day long. I wouldn't have been able to take it. In earplugs. 
A father should encourage his children to pursue their dreams. He should help them prepare for the challenges they will face. He should give them his total support as they enter life as an adult. Right? How many of y'all, your, your dads taught you how to check the oil and transmission fluid in the air in your tire in your car? Right? No? How many, how many of your dads taught, taught you boys how to shave? No? How many dads taught their daughters how to shave their legs? No? We're, we should support our children in every aspect of their life, teaching them the things that, you know what, maybe we weren't taught, but we know now. Right on? You know, don't, don't just let them go through life not knowing or, or guessing. You know what? Send them out the door with knowledge because knowledge is power. Amen? Three, a father should also help his children prepare for developing relationships. A father should teach his children the kind of a person to choose as friends, the kind of a person to look for as a light mate, Without specific direction, they won't know the kind of person they should marry. I heard this story one time about a, uh, a foster parent who uh, the kid came up and said, Dad, he said, I, I, I think this girl likes me. What should I do? And he said, oh, I got the perfect example for you. He said, just go around and, and pick up heavy things. Pick up people. You know, and grunt once in a while. You know, and he said, and the kid was like, and he's like, yeah, that's it. He said, she'll love you. He was just being an example, you know. I mean, not necessarily did he want his kid to go out and do those things, but he's just giving him an example, a funny example of, you know what, this is how we think girls really like us because we can pick up heavy things. Amen. Or we can reach things on the top shelf, right? Who, who doesn't love a tall guy? I mean, you know, short women, they love tall guys. Why? Because they can reach the farthest up item and they don't have to get a stool to do it. Praise God. Our Heavenly Father has prepared a future for us in heaven. Earthly fathers must help their children prepare for the future here on earth for their eternity in heaven. Here's my conclusion. God gives us a blueprint for fatherhood because he is the perfect father. He loves us. He gives to us. He expects us to follow him, and he prepares a future for us. These are things we can do for our children, not as a tyrant, right? You don't have to be this overruling dictator in your child's life. But as a gentle, loving, caring father. If your father is gone, if you didn't have the relationship with your father that you would have liked to have had or wanted, you can take comfort in the fact to know that God is your father. And he is exactly the kind of father you want. He loves you and he will help you experience fulfillment in this life and for all eternity if you will put your faith in him amen happy father's day god we're your children and we know you love us we're gathered here because why because we want to celebrate what god has done for us in our lives we are men of god we are children of God. We are a family of God. And that's how we will always want to be known. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in your glorious and magnanimous name. You can reach down and you can change the direction and the, and the mindset. But Lord, you're a gentleman and you decided that you wanted to just let us go our own way. And you've given us example.
loves you, and...